it's great that we can now be free and go wherever we want to. I feel more comfortable, but not everyone feels comfortable. You can't really go into a, a straight bar and drag and feel 100% comfortable. Yeah. I still think that, you know, there's a need for safe spaces for LGBT people because, you know, as much as things have improved, it's still around, you know, homophobia is still around. And it's nice to be able to just come somewhere and just not have to worry about it. You know what I mean? You can just literally be yourself. You can kiss your boyfriend. Yeah. You can hold hands. You can just, you know, n nobody will say a thing. Claire, have you got that bit of Yeah. Have a look. Yeah. See what you think. Oh. Look, it's going back. Oh. Jesus Christ! It's what you get for having spinal problems. One, yeah. two, three. Oh. You know? Jesus Christ, look at the size of them! This has actually been an LGBT venue for about 80 years. LGBT people are subject to hate crimes in cities still. Some people will call out you in the street or assault you. And that's why somewhere like this is so important for the future as a safe space. I think when that blue light comes on, it's going to look green. <laughs> One day when I was out sitting with my parents, a customer says to me, you go in that gay bar. I was going, gay bar? It's up for sale. I went, don't be silly, that's never up for sale. We looked into it and my parents go for it. I've never worked behind a bar in my life. I was going against this guy who was going to invest £50,000. This is 20 years ago. And I didn't have anything extra, only me. It was all I could give. I eventually got it, I was impressed. When I asked about why didn't you take on the guy with the £50,000? And this says because he just wants to build a business to sell it to make money. We feel you've got passion and you really care for this pub and you're going to be there a long time and we can feel that. That's why we want you to do it. I don't feel any other venues what I feel at the Foresters because I go to the Forest from the moment I walk in to the moment I leave I know they're looking after me they're always asking if I need anything, if everything is okay, uh, how I have been, even if I don't go there for months. They saw my son growing up, they met my son when my son was well, six years old. My son is nearly 25 now. My parents live in Portugal, they're in the 80s, and still they don't talk to me, still they don't accept me, and God help them if I ever tell them that I'm now a woman, physically a woman. I probably would end up killing them take you through the back way. <laughs> so these are my stairs, nicely recarpeted. And this is where my friends said it looks like an, the entrance to an Indian takeaway. <laughs> so this is it. It's not massive, but it's more than enough for me. This is my bedroom. We've got very high ceilings. Me and my mum redecorated when we moved in. This is where I tend to hide away. This is my sanctuary. <laughs> my sister um, managed to find information for the lesbian gay switchboard in Nottingham. And I phoned them up and basically said, I'm 18, so I can go for a drink, but I don't know where to go. Is there anywhere I can go? So this young lady on the te telephone, one of the volunteers said, we're gonna go to a pub in Nottingham um, called the Forester's Arms. She met me at the front of the door. I was scared to death. Oh my God. We walked in and it was full of lesbians. Oh, they were scary. Oh dear. They were walking around looking dead butch. Um, they wore vests. They had our hairy armpits. The stereotype what people think that, that women should look like. Oh, I didn't look at them. I, I'd walk in and i smile and I, I just felt like I was a little tiny baby. I think about like when I came out, um, there were a lot of gay bars to go to, you know? Um, and I think if I came out and there were no gay bars, I'd have been petrified. There's no way I'd have been able to go. I mean, meeting a guy for the first time was petrifying enough. You know, to have to maybe go and do that in a Weatherspoons. 
you know, it's, it, I don't think I would have done it. I know that I, when I've had a drink, I can get very loud and very camp. Um, and the things we talk about, you know, are a bit taboo. And if that was happening in a straight bar, you know, people might get, people might feel a bit uncomfortable about the stuff that we're talking about, you know, and it's nice to be in a place where no one's going to look twice, you know what I mean? Because that's just the everyday chit chat. <laughs> You know, so I do think that it's important. And this is the filthiest room in my flat. This is the drag room. So this is where the magic happens. This is where we go from men to women, or in Tessa's case, as close as she can get. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always a tip in here. I, I clean up every week after the drag queens have been in. It gets to a point where I'm like, you know what, I can't even be bothered. <laughs> when Tess comes in here, literally, she just explodes all the clothes everywhere. <laughs> she tries her best to keep it tidy though, bless her. I first came out at, at the age of 18, but I knew very young before that, when I was at school. Especially when you saw that teacher, female teacher, and you go, oh, she looks nice. Why do I feel different towards her? They said this word, I never heard this word ever in my life at school called lesbian. And I was like 11, 12, and I, when I go and ask what does lesbian mean, they just burst out laughing. Queen Victoria found it impossible to believe that there could ever be such a thing as a female homosexual. And even now, a lot of people just simply don't imagine that lesbians in most cases can be ordinary like everyone else. It's always important in every side of society to have the elders involved with the younger generation, not only for the knowledge, but the stories. We have so much stories to tell, things that used to happen, things that we can sit down and talk about it. Someone went to the toilet in the men's toilets and basically came out and said, um, um, I think you've got a problem with the toilet. Walked in there and I was horrified. Somebody had literally come in, all tooled up, and removed the toilet basin off the pipe, unscrewed it from the floor, moved it to one side of the toilet cubicle and pooed where the toilet was and left it like that. I remember going down, we got a little alleyway where my dogs used to go, it's called Shit Alley. And I was watching these young lads keep nipping down Shit Alley. So I went outside and I saw this uh, big tall guy, looked about six foot. When I looked down, this one on his knees giving the boss, the guy, a blowjob. So I smacked him on the back of the head. Unfortunately, he nearly choked. So sorry, Devin, so sorry, Devin. Move. He moved, and this guy is still standing there like that. With his hard on on, not realising, little guppy's got off his, off his tail. We come from a generation where things they weren't as easy as they are now. For me, being a trans woman, 15 years ago, I could not have come out or worked even have a life like I have now. I was working in a place on Exchange Walk called Super Colour Studios. And I'd worked there four years learning how to do photocopying. Loved it, absolutely amazing. Uh, the laughs we would have. One thing I never did was I never told him I was gay. I was, I was scared. And then I got called in one day, there was this new manager. And he basically says to me, um, we've had a complaint. And I went, what's the complaint? They went, um, you touched somebody. I was like, what? Where did I touch them? And apparently what happened was, this young girl who'd worked for me for about two years, found out that I was gay because someone saw me walking into this pub and jumped to the conclusion that I was gay. So when I said to him, how did I supposedly touch her? Was it a sexual touch or something? He goes, no, you reached over to get the photographs at the same time she did and accidentally touched her hand. I was like, really? And every time I walked into that workplace, the girls all moved to one side of the room. And I, I went home, I was so upset about it. And I says, I got to do something about life. I got to do something different. So it's a family circle, McFit is back at Biscuits. Biscuits. Oh, oh, four of the fuckers, what is one prize? I hope Debbie will stay there for a long more time, to be honest. 
because she's um, she's one of them that she's necessary to the community. She's needed within the community, and I told her that myself. So I am shocked that I survived so long. I don't know what happened from 10 year to the 20 year point. It's gone by so quick. I have stood in that DJ box, looked across and seen the place packed with maybe a cabaret show on or a tribute band on or just karaoke or just disco and stood up there dead proud. And I don't know, you just get this overwhelming sense of proudness and you've done it. You know, you stand there and you go, they hear, they enjoy themselves because this is what I've created. And you can't get that in any other job. Oh, <laughs> the best overall venue in Nottingham is the 